right, I guess we uh, might as well get it started. I'm sure people will be trickling in as, as we go forward. But uh, today I'm here to talk to you guys about the role of wearable technology and how it will ultimately trickle over and have large scale implications into how we do things in life, everything from riding a motorcycle to driving a car. And specifically, one, one thing I want to touch upon, which is the, the title of today's breakout session, is how we are able to crowdsource safety through the use of Android wearables. So I'm going to kind of run through a, a standard presentation that I've put together. Uh, it's something I've become quite familiar with. And I use that as my framework for this discussion because it's, a, it's kind of the lens through which I've gone through this entire endeavor, bringing my own startup company to fruition over the last couple months. Please uh, let me get started. So I, and I hope I want to make this clear to everybody, I am one of the most diehard motorcyclists you'll ever meet. I love it. I've been riding motorcycles since I was a kid. My father got me on my first dirt bike when I was way too young to be on a dirt bike. And uh, I realized pretty early on that I was, I was pretty much addicted. It's one of the most exhilarating experiences that I've had the good fortune to, uh, to participate in. And it's been a big part of my life. Uh, in, 2012, I was in a motorcycle accident on the West Side Highway in New York, and uh, for the first time in my life, I said, you know, maybe, maybe motorcycle riding is not the smartest thing for me to do. Maybe I, I'm going to give it up. I'm going I'm to hang up my helmet for a little while and, and uh, take some time off. And that was, that was about four or five months after I got this tattoo on my forearm that says Ride for Life. So. I, I remember telling my, one of my riding buddies, yeah, I think I'm going to you know, give it up for a little while, sell my bike. And he laughed at me and said, you, you're literally going to be branded a hypocrite for the rest of your life. And I realized, well, you know, that's a very good point. And between a couple of my friends and my father and you know, a lot of people that meant a lot to me coming to me and saying, hey, Ryan, didn't you go to school for engineering? Aren't you the guy who built an electric motorcycle in his garage in three days? Can't you do something to kind of change the way you feel about this whole situation, you think that motorcycle riding is so dangerous, make it safer. And it was a crazy idea in the beginning, and you know, making motorcycle riding safer, how does one start? And I found wearables to be that outlet. Uh, this right here is the Guardian. It's, it's the product my team and I, seated in the second row right here, have been working on for the last four and a half months. Um, it's been a labor of love. But what I've realized is that while we all have our smartphones in our pockets, they're limited in what they can do and what they can provide us. So the next step, the, the natural evolution is towards wearable devices that provide added utility that goes well beyond what a cell phone can achieve. Now, it doesn't mean we have to disregard the fact that you have your cell phone. And this device, like many other wearables, leverages the fact that you've got that computer in your pocket. And some of the processing that will go into you know, the, the usability in this product is done on the phone. Your GPS data is piped up to the helmet from your phone. It's leveraging the fact that now we've got 3G and 4G connectivity almost at 100% of a, a penetration into the market. And that means people who are riding Harleys, people who are riding sport bikes, people who like going on long cruises, those are, the, you know, those are all people who can then rest assured knowing that with the utility provided to them through a device like this, they can ride safer. And I'm going to get a little bit more into that and into some of the numbers just to show you how big of an implication this is. So as you see right here on the screen, this statistic is uh, it's pretty staggering. It shows that less than 1% of all miles covered in the US on an annual basis are covered by motorcycles. It's not a lot of miles. However, motorcyclists and their companions account for 14% of all road fatalities in the US. We're one of the countries that's not on the lower tier of, of that, uh, you know, that number. When you look at some Asian countries, those figures are drastically higher, and it shows a significant need for advanced safety gear. Automobile drivers and their occupants have crumple zones. They've got airbags. They've got seatbelts. These are not luxuries afforded to motorcycle riders. So we rely on our helmets, our jackets, our gloves, our boots, and what we can strap to our bodies. There are actually some motorcycles that have airbags, believe it or not. Not many. It's, it's, it's a, I believe the Honda Goldwing was one, one such model. Um, but we're, we're pretty much relying on what we can strap to our body to keep us safe. And you know, what else do we strap to our body but wearables? So let me, uh, let me continue. Now, when we set out to build a helmet, we said, hey, if this is, is going to be a helmet, that's the project. It's not a jacket. It's not gloves. We'll start with the helmet. That's the most critical piece of safety gear a motorcyclist relies on on the road. And 
we decided, okay, well, first and foremost, we want to be able to provide them with visual information as to what's happening behind them. Because when you're on a motorcycle, you're looking down at your mirrors, or you're turning your head around to find out what's happening behind you. With the solution that we've done, by integrating a transparent heads-up display, we're no longer requiring you to take your eyes off the road ahead of you. you know, first and foremost, that's a direct result of, or, or sorry, I should say, it's a direct benefit that the user receives is now they can make sure all of their attention is forward facing. You never want to take your eyes off the road ahead of you because that creates a dangerous riding condition. It's, an, it's the last thing you want to do on a bike. Second, I said, well, you know, all right, there's, there's a computer system in your pocket. It's your cell phone. But we got to make sure that there's a computer system on board. And I think this, this ties into today's event because we're running Android in this helmet. The embedded computer system, this one's actually running Ice Cream Sandwich. Uh, it's, it's, a great platform to develop upon for wearables. Um, we've, we've found some ease, not just because, you know, the initial things that we were building into it uh, were Android, uh, were optimized for Android use, but you know, we found that the companies we were partnering with were, were building into the Android stack as well, and it, it made for some easy out-of-the-box integration of, of additional features. Um, uh, there's a, a, a company called Augury, the CEO of the company's Fortunate enough to, uh, we're fortunate enough to have him here with us today. Their company uh, specializes in computer vision. They're going to be powering the computer vision capabilities in our helmet that will provide riders with knowledge of their following distance, whether or not they're tailgating cars or if cars are tailgating them. Say someone's coming up on your rear at an accelerated rate, the helmet will be able to provide warnings. So without building in computer technology into this helmet, without turning this regular helmet into a wearable, those, those utilities did not exist. Further, like many wearable devices, this is a connected device. It's Bluetooth and Wi-Fi enabled. So as we said, it's leveraging the fact that you've got a data plan, you've got a cell phone in your pocket. It can pipe up GPS coordinates to the helmet in the event that you have an accident. The helmet uses that data connection to connect you to an emergency response person similar to OnStar. Think of it as OnStar for motorcycles. We're calling it the guardian angel service. So you're, you're being protected not only physically when you go down, the helmet is crash worthy, it will protect your brain, but now you're being protected retroactively because you've got someone looking out for your best interest at all times. Without wearables, this is impossible. So I want to share with you guys a little bit of a, you know, the user experience. As you can see, when, when you are wearing the Guardian, you've got a, access to a, a wide angle rear view feed being piped up right in front of your uh, eyes through the heads up display. You've got speed indication, direction of travel, turn by turn navigations, point, point of interest, uh, buddy tracking. So in the event I, I go through a yellow light and my friends get caught at the red light and I don't want to have to stop and pull over on the shoulder and, and wait for a truck to come and, and you know, take me off the road, I, I'm going to continue riding because that's the safe thing to do. And my friends know now that because they'll have the app in their phone and I've got the app in my phone, I can be constantly dropping them waypoints. And it's all done automatically. I'm not physically doing it. I'm not instructing the system to do it. If they detect that we've been separated, it's all automatic. Um, we've got comms, so I don't know if anyone in the audience is a motorcycle rider or if you've used Bluetooth communication systems before, but there are, are range issues. If you get more than a couple hundred feet away from one another, you can't hear each other, and that's just a limitation of Bluetooth. But if that Bluetooth uh, connection is only going from your head to your pocket, distance isn't an issue. And then we're using your data plan to make sure that you communicate with your friends seamlessly and effortlessly. Now, I was just mentioning the Guardian Angel service, and, and this is kind of uh, one of the mainstays of what we're doing. Uh, we, we believe that by providing riders with this added sense of security, it's a it's going to kind of free up your mind a little bit. Now you don't have to ride constantly being worried that, you know, wh what's going to happen if I were to go down. If I'm on a dark and twisty road in the back country and I go off the road and there's no cars there to drive by and, and come to my aid, this system allows me to know that even when I'm alone, I'm still protected. So everyone likes to share things. We've got cameras so you can share still and video photography, but what if you find a really nice trail? What if you're on your dirt bike, you're not on your street bike, and you're out going through the woods or the desert, and you find some really nice scenic areas that you want to share with your friends? Now, you've recorded the video, you've taken the pictures, you can also now log your geo data. So, we're going to build an online community where people can come and share these things, and we're building in multiple levels of content that we can share with our friends and our family, most importantly, the guys we ride with. Now, when we're recording all of that video, we have the option of embedding 
the entire user experience through this translation of the user interface into the video. Now what that does is it really just tells your friends this is what it's like to ride with the world's smartest helmet, maybe making them a little jealous, maybe it's a, you know, a bit of a equipment measuring contest, if you will, and I mean motorcycle equipment, gentlemen. Um, and further, we have the ability to live stream. So without building a device that's connected, it's a wearable, none of this happens. So now you're losing out on added utility, you're losing out on enjoyment, but most importantly, you're losing out on safety. Now, the domestic market in the US, and I'm not gonna get too much into the numbers here because this isn't an investor pitch, and I'll actually flip through a couple of these in, in a moment, but you can see that there's over 10 million motorcycles in use in, in, in the US today. And that's just registered on the road. Uh, if you take into account off-road use between quads and snowmobiles and dirt bikes, that number almost doubles. So it, it's between three and 5% of the US population is actively engaged in motorcycle and off-road use. It's a lot of us. I mean, that means for a room of 100 people, five of those people are, are gonna be people who are directly interested in, in stuff like this because they know that when their safety is at stake, you don't wanna take the risk and building wearables that are gonna allow us to build in extra levels of protection is the natural progression of the way the markets are gonna go. So I'm gonna skip through a little bit of some financial stuff. Um, I, I will stop and make mention right here. I'd like to thank two of my co-founders in the audience, Todd and Clayton. Um, you know, without my, without my great team here, I wouldn't have been able to uh, you know, get as far with this project as, as we have in such a quick time, um, as well as Dima, a member of our advisory board. Um, you know, and we've, we've been fortunate enough to receive some notable press as of late, and I, I think that's a direct result of how much people realize that there is significance in what we're doing. And, and that's not just us, it's not Fuser, it's not Augury, it's, it's everyone that's working on devices that are gonna make us safer. And it, it goes beyond the road and racetrack, it goes beyond motorcycles and cars. I was speaking with a gentleman earlier who's doing a project uh, you know, that integrates advanced sensors into Firefighter helmets, and you know this isn't something that even crossed my mind until today. Uh, helmets come in all different shapes and sizes. And actually, I touch upon that right here. You know, the technology we're building into the helmet scales well for other different use cases. When little Johnny's playing football and he gets his clock cleaned, I want his coach and the referees and his parents getting a notification that that hit that he just sustained was in the range of what's potentially a, a traumatic injury-inducing hit, and he gets pulled off the field and he's you know given medical attention. That's the world we're going to live in. It's not happening today. In five years, in 10 years, it will be happening. You know, there's, there's advanced materials and, and advanced sensors that we can integrate into the devices and the equipment that we use on a daily basis to make lives better by increasing our safety and thereby increasing our enjoyment of those activities. So that's the end of my presentation, but what I wanna do is I wanna just kinda speak about the future of wearables is, and, and how it pertains to, to safety, uh, specifically in relation to uh, automotive and motorcycle use. So uh, when we set out to do this, I didn't realize um, you know, what all of the implications were. It, it wasn't long before I started to realize, hey, listen, there's an insurance play here with having a black box feature built in. You know, now I, I can protect people who get hit by drivers who then leave the scene. You know, with two wide angle HD cameras, both shooting uh, in HD quality, you're probably gonna get a license plate if someone hits and runs. Um, if someone blows through a red light, you're probably gonna have a good record of that. And that's gonna protect people after the fact. So now you're taking safety technology from the realm of passive into the realm of active. And that's the next logical step. And as, as a species, humans have gotten really good at looking at, at data, big data sets. I'm sure everyone's heard big data. And we're, we're very good now, at, or at least we're getting better at pulling important information from those data sets and using them and applying them in, in real world use cases to improve our products, improve our quality of life. And as we do that, we'll be able to look at user behavior. We'll be able to look at data pulled in from the cameras that relates to what's going on in our localized environment. Um, you know, so you're driving through an urban environment. Imagine having every motorcyclist in New York City wearing one of these helmets. And as they're navigating, I believe the number that in, in terms of all of the Google map cars, those automated autonomous cars that drive around and, and map out the world as we know it, it's only about 300 in the world, I believe, something to that order. There are 8 million residents in the city, and if 3 to 5 percent of them are on motorcycles, you can imagine how many people could be collecting data about the localized environment within the five boroughs. So now, you're driving around as 
things change, as signs are moved, as the local construction of the, you know, of, of the infrastructure has is updated and constantly changed, you can now use all of that big data to update your maps, update your information related to the city and, and the road system on the fly, in real time almost. You're effectively updating your systems a whole order of uh, magnitude faster than what you could do with a couple of the, you know, even if it was 300 Google cars cruising around New York City at all times. So it goes beyond everything that we're doing. The, you know, the computer vision capabilities that, that Augury has uh, developed are, are, are pretty outstanding and I think we're very fortunate to say that they're helping us power some of the features in our helmet. Um, you know, I'm excited to be a part of this. I think that this is both within on-road and off-road and sports use and you know when you're when you're engaging in activities that save lives like firefighting or you know a crisis response you know when when tsunamis hit and when earthquakes occur uh, you know people are uh, as you can see you know with recent events people are very prone to wanting to run in and, and help people out and in order to protect the people who are trying to help others you know we need to equip them with the right devices, the right wearables that will keep them safe in doing so. And you know, that's, that's one way of making sure that we can continue helping one another out at, you know, on, a, on a societal level, on a localized level. Um, I do want to open the floor up. Uh, I, I hope some of you guys have questions and I want to kind of open this up and, and have it as an armchair session where we can touch upon different topics. So at, at this time I'd like to invite any of you guys to, to field some questions and, and uh, I'd be happy to you know, chime in and, and, and uh, get, a, get a dialogue going. Yes, over here. Yeah, so um, how much would something like this cost, or how much overhead would there be from you know, traditional and then one? So specifically with, with regard to the Guardian as we've designed it, um, it's comparable to another high-end helmet that one might go, um, purchase on the open market. Um, one, one comparison I can make, there's a, a very well-respected company uh, called Schuberth. If you're a motorcycle rider, you, you've probably heard of Schuberth helmets. They're German-made, wonderfully engineered. You can go buy the Schuberth C3. It's a, it's a high-end helmet, retails for about 700, 750. And then you buy their communication system, that's another 400. And then if you want to buy two GoPro cameras, it's at least 400, you know, if you're getting the base models. And, and that doesn't have any of the crash detection capabilities or access to the Guardian Angel service. If you bought all of those items, which gets you close, but not quite to where we're at, you'd spend over $2,000. We're going to come to market about 12 to 1300. Yes. I, I know that this is, you know, uh, you know IO extended and all that. And Android is really nice and all, but when, why Android? Why not some other board out there? So, our earlier prototype you'll see over here is actually uh, it's it's running dual systems. Uh, it's got an Arduino in it as well as an Android system, and it's a great marriage between the two. But it ultimately, it was it was done to prove concept, but for marketability and, and going to market with a consumer-ready product, Arduinos aren't really suitable. Um, in, in terms of how we went down the path that led us to Android, when I started investigating what our options were for transparent heads-up displays, most of the companies were building into Android. I've found that a lot of the companies that we're looking to work with are all building into Android. It's, it's growing in terms of market share. Uh, it makes a lot more sense to, to build into Android than it does to iOS right now. What I, what I was getting at was that it was a great idea uh, because uh, I, me and my friends, we, we tinker around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would be cool when it's parked, but outside of that, like, right. so as far as it goes, Android is a great way to kind of take all of that and bring it together. And it looks like a nice, uh, you know, that one looks kind of nice, sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a glorified breadboard system. It, it does work or, and it functions and it was great you know, for getting us to the next step. But you're, you're totally right. Android's a great system that will allow you to work with different bits and pieces and, and, and kind of tie them all together a little bit easier than if you were working with different platforms. And I commend you and your friends for tinkering. I, I'm, a, I'm a big tinkerer myself. Yes? Um, I noticed that uh, on the, the image that was shown up there, it kind of looked like Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, was it, or is, is that like the final design? 
So I'll open up the visor right here, show you guys what the, what the form factor we're working with now. It's a lot more slimline. Uh, it's a lot more consumer friendly, I'd say, but it's not quite indicative of what we're going to market with. We're keeping that one up our sleeve a little bit, but uh, I, I promise you it's impressive. Yes. So yeah, it's it's one of the features that's that we've begun some development on. It's uh, I'd like to say it's working great right now. I don't want to lie to you. <laughs> it uh, but in, in in a localized environment, indoors where you have strong Wi-Fi, you can you can stream with decent quality. Um, but ultimately, we're we're looking to have the capabilities to broadcast this with simply a, a mobile hotspot with 4G connectivity, so that people who want to stick that in their back pocket can go for a ride and invite people to view what they're seeing in real time. It will have detrimental effects on battery life. However, I mean, we're, we're kind of nipping that one in the bud by installing a photovoltaic cell on the top of the helmet. And fortunately, people ride motorcycles when it's nice and sunny out, most of the time at least. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you're standing still at a red light or cruising on the highway in even overcast conditions, it will help uh, offset battery drain and that'll extend the life of the battery and allow you to do more while you're riding without fear of, of the system dying. So that'll go through the cell phone? Correct. Or, or, or it could be a, a Verizon MyY hotspot, for instance. Okay. Cool. Yes? How long does the battery last? So the battery in this unit is good for about six hours, um, but we weren't really striving for increased battery life in this one. Uh, the, the next prototype that we're working on currently has about eight to 10 hours, um, depending on what features are enabled. And with the solar array on a sunny day, you should have enough battery to ride from sun up to sundown. And, and how many uh, minutes of video? Have? We haven't done enough testing to, to really give you a firm answer on that right now. Um, you know, as things progress, we'll be releasing some some snippets of uh, of the you know technical specifications. Um, but we're we're hoping to maintain at a bare minimum eight hours of use, and that's and that's kind of putting a heavy load on the system. Yes. Um, is the black box intended to be on the phone or on board storage? Great question. We have a, a onboard solid state drive as well as SD cards. So when you're going and filming your rides, that will get saved onto the SD cards, but in the event that you go down, all of that's locked into the solid state drive. Yes? I know you built it for safety, but like, are there other Android features, like with weather or other things that you foresee popping up being available that or you, like, you know, whether it shows you the weather or mm -hmm. shows you, I don't know, any other things you do with your Android phone? So uh, in, the, in the beginning of the video clip that played, uh, the first thing that happened when the system was turned on is because the temperature was close to freezing, there was, an, there was a cold temperature warning, proceed with caution. Um, I, I would argue that uh, weather and traffic concerns are safety related. Um, you know, it, it's, That's a bad example. But I mean, no, I, mean I, I don't think it was a bad example. I, 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 just, I, I think much of what you can, um, what, much of what you can discuss that relates to motorcycle riding has some kind of safety connotation. It, everything comes down to safety when you're riding a motorcycle. This one's great. I mean, I, I wore this. Uh, we rode up the coast from Los Angeles to Silicon Valley a couple of weeks, about three weeks ago, Todd and myself. We had a chase car, and we were filming some footage, and, and we were wearing the helmet back and forth. I mean, the only discomfort was uh, you know, taking it off and then putting it back on, and maybe it was a little sweaty on the inside. And that's a weird feeling. But for the most part, I mean, it's not much heavier than a standard helmet. It's, it's nearly negligible. You don't notice the added weight. Um, it's, it's not significant enough to, for it to be uh, detrimental for your use. What were you riding on that ride? <laughs> uh, we had a Ducati Hyperstrada and a Monster 696. Way different bikes, both of them are awesome. Um, the Hyperstrata has a little bit more of a leg extension, so when my knee acted up, I'd ask Todd to switch. But for the most part, um, it was pretty fun. I have to say those bikes are, are both very well-made machines, and I can't wait to get my own. No pressure, anybody. <laughs> So uh, on, on this unit and on the earlier unit that we've developed, the, the micro projectors are side-oriented. Orient, uh, the 
ultimate design has been changed so that your peripheral vision is not impeded um, moving forward. So, I mean, that, that was a concern that some people had expressed to me earlier today, and, and I'm, I'm happy to say that um, your peripheral vision is not impeded at all with this system, and we're improving on it by um, using a smaller microprojector for the production unit. It's a slightly different orientation and it's a smaller form factor. Oh, okay, so it's just hmm? more out of the way, Yep. <laughs> yes? Are you guys uh, rolling this out only like on your own uh, helmet or are you going to be licensing this out to others? Excellent question. Um, and it's something that we're investigating right now. Um, we've had some high level conversations with companies that uh, produce helmets right now and there is interest in licensing the technology. Um, I think ultimately we'll probably go to market in the US ourselves um, as our first order of business, um, you know, to establish the brand, get these on the market, um, first and foremost with a beta testing program that we're looking to start up in, in due time. And uh, if there are any motorcyclists in the audience, I encourage you to go to fusertech.com and sign up for our beta test. Um, but yeah, as, as I said, uh, there's, there's definitely an opportunity for us to make sure that this technology gets in the hands of all of the major helmet manufacturers. My goal is to make motorcycle riding safer. Realistically speaking, if we're the only company that features this technology, that's not going to happen. So I want to put it in the hands of many so that we can kind of work together and, and crowdsource, if you will, um, you know, ways to improve upon the platform. And, uh, and I think that speaks a little bit you know, to, to what we're talking about or the theme of this breakout session. But uh, yeah, putting it in the hands of different manufacturers who are going to see things differently and have different customers who demand different things from, their, uh, from the products that they use will be best equipped as a motorcycle riding community to further develop the product and make sure that we're going in line with what's going to give us the ultimate, most safest helmet that you could ever imagine. Most safe. Yeah. About, safest. Uh, safe. Yeah, so uh, on, the, on the last slide, I, I showcased a couple different types of helmets. Um, the platform, as we've begun developing into it, um, revealed to us that it was highly scalable. So you know, there might not be a complete translation between a bicycle helmet and a motorcycle helmet. Bicyclists, for instance, don't necessarily need the same heads-up display and rear-view capabilities. The little mirrors that they have on their helmets are quite effective. You'd be surprised. But they might want access to the Guardian Angel system and have accelerometers and other sensors that are built into the platform. So we do see scalability for all different types of uses. Because it seems like then my, my dad is a big uh, biker uh, and cyclist. Mm -hmm. uh, having that, that GPS and direction so if you're, you get lost or detoured or whatever, you don't have to stop in the middle of traffic trying to figure out where you are. Right. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of danger when you're sitting in the shoulder of a highway that may only be six feet wide, pulling out your smartphone, trying to find where you're going. So, you know, by building out this device that has, you know, the ability to pull map data up from your phone and, and give you real-time directions to your destination, we're preventing that need. You won't have to pull over on the side of the highway. And that goes for motorcyclists, that goes for cyclists. I mean, people who ride bicycles, at least in New York City, they're riding on the street. You can't ride on the sidewalks. So there are certain things you want to you keep in the platform when you scale to a helmet that's designed for bicycle use. But uh, it's, it's definitely high up on the, uh, the pecking order for us. Uh, one of my co-founders is an avid cyclist, and he, he keeps drilling it into my head how we need to make a bicycle helmet. So uh, I, I think that makes a, a logical move for us in terms of second product. Uh, it's something we're considering. Uh, great question. I don't even think, I think that might have slipped my mind. But uh, yeah, so we're currently uh, experimenting with different types of microphones, trying to find what's, what's best equipped for road use because motorcycle helmets are prone to uh, a lot of wind noise. And um, the design of the helmet is being done to help minimize wind buffeting and try and make sure that the, the sound inside the helmet is not super loud where it will interfere with the ability for the microphone to detect what you're saying. We're also uh, working with a throat microphone which uh, eliminates wind noise uh, almost completely. It's just a, it's a different user experience so we're not sure if that's you know, the way we're going to go. It's uh, you know we're still in development. Yeah there's some interesting things being done with uh, bone induction 
Um, and we've, we've toyed around with some ideas. Um, the, the big thing with a motorcycle helmet is every contact with every, every point of contact with your head is padded. So introducing a bone conducting mic is tricky. Uh, it's an engineering challenge. I don't think it's completely ruled out. It's one of the things that we're looking into. Um, a bone conducting speaker might be more appropriate. Instead of using it on, on the speaker itself, we'd use it on the actual shell of the helmet. So the entire inside of the helmet becomes a speaker. Um, just another option, you know, we're, we're currently going through the, our paces and trying to figure out what's the best option for us, um, you know, both from a usability perspective and a cost perspective. Yes? Have you tried to measure the impact of, of your technology on safety? In terms of, I mean, we haven't done a lot of, I mean, we've been conducting road testing. Um, I've dropped a helmet once or twice accidentally and it still functions. But, uh, I mean, I'm well, the, it, ideally, um, we'll, we'll get more data related to accident avoidance once we're conducting our beta tests uh, officially. But um, you know, the computer vision capabilities that we're building in will allow you to know if someone's tailgating you. you know, if you're riding and you're not paying attention exactly to what's being displayed in your rear view feed, um, as certain following thresholds are, are surpassed, you'll be receiving warnings. So, you know, hey, heads up. Someone's coming up on your six o'clock, maybe you want to change lanes. Maybe you want to get out of his way, avert your course as necessary. Do motorcycles have, like cars have that sort of onboard computer you can send into? Some newer bikes do. So that would allow us to uh, design a module that would interface with the motorcycle and transmit uh, information about the bike, you know, everything from temperature, tack, and, and pipe that right up to the helmet. So now people, especially for motorcycle racers who need that information, and right now a lot of what we do prevents riders from having to look down at their speedometer or look down at their mirrors, a racer is still going to have to look down at his tack, but if he's got it in his helmet, that's one use case where a device like that would be really useful. It's not necessarily a wearable, but it interfaces with a wearable, so I mean, I guess it's worth noting. Well, it's the internet of yeah, absolutely. And even Harley Davidson's coming out with an electric motorcycle. I don't know if any of you guys saw that this week, but uh, it's uh, it's it's definitely uh, it's an exciting time. And sorry, <laughs> so we actually we we uh, we're, we're considering integrating micro radar technology. Um, to help us build out this concept of a safety bubble. So uh, as vehicles enter that bubble, not only do you have computer vision in play, but computer vision only works when you're looking at the objects. But if there's a module that mounts to the front and rear of your motorcycle, it doesn't matter which way you're looking. If something's coming up on your rear, you'll have a warning. And, and that'll all communicate through Bluetooth as well. So you got the Iron Man helmet. There's a body that <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty sure my co-founders cringe anytime someone mentions Iron Man. Um, I have a question for you. <laughs> there, there are some people who are opposed to wearing helmets. I'm not sure what the principle at stake is, freedom, something like that. But I, I wonder what the reaction of that, the person, uh, a person with that kind of mindset, mm -hmm. who might be technologically inclined or likes gadgets, that if that, uh, you know, you, could you be effective in marketing to that type of person? And if so, you've got a safety kind of bonus right, right off the bat there. You're taking people who are inclined towards technology but not inclined to wearing helmets and you can convert them to helmet use, that's, that's got a big impact. Yeah, uh, and we're, we're finding that this concept is being very well received by exactly those types of people. People who said, hey, I, I don't normally wear a helmet, but when does this thing come out? I have to have one. Yeah, and they're coming in in droves. I mean, when we, when we had our first piece of press coverage on a nationwide level, we had, in, in span of three or four days, like 1,200 signups to our beta test. And I poured through each and every single one. And you know, I, I read directly from guys who said, I've been riding Harleys for 20 years. I never wear a helmet. 
I, I want to get my hands on this. How much is it going to cost? You know, does it have this feature? Does it have that feature? And we're kind of using that data to help kind of understand what the market is, is looking for in a product like this. But uh, we're seeing that there's a definite interest in people who don't normally wear helmets, which is great. I mean, it, it, right now it's, it's roughly 58% of motorcyclists wear helmets. Only 21 states have universal requirement laws for helmet use. But that trend is, is moving in our favor. And bike helmets, same way. I mean, yep. I think in Jersey the law is like 16. You don't have to wear a helmet anymore. You see a lot of 16-year-old kids riding around yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, w I would, I would only hope. And then when, when they grow up wearing a Fuser bicycle helmet and turn 18, and you know, tell their parents to uh, take a hike, and they're going to go buy a motorcycle, it's, it's logical for them to say, hey, well, I rode a, with a Fuser bicycle helmet, I might as well get a Fuser motorcycle helmet. See, my, my, my wife used to treat brain injuries, and she's still in that field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The uh, I mean, when we f when we finished our first Alpha prototype, I think I wore it for a good four hours until the battery died. I was in my apartment just kind of walking around. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that was one of the types of helmets that we were showing. I mean, I, in the winter time, it's kind of cold. Riding motorcycles, not so much fun. Snowboarding is a lot of fun. So I mean, for me, there's a personal interest, but it's a huge market as well. Um, you know, there are almost as many skiing and snowboarding helmets sold in the U.S. as there are motorcycle helmets. So, it's it's a little much for this application. Yeah, I mean you're moving pretty fast. There's there's not generally an issue with with water building up. It's not like a, it, and also it's a curved surface, so it's not the same as, as the windshield on your, on your automobile. And a lot of people will treat their visors with Rain-X. It's, it's not a major issue when you have lots of scratches on your lens, then it does tend to be an issue. But if, the, if that's the case, you probably shouldn't be riding in bad weather. So I mean, there, there is some accountability on the part of the rider. You have to know when it's going to be safe for you to go on the road. Um, and in those conditions, as soon as you boot the helmet up, it would tell you that there's inclement weather. Maybe it's a good idea to park the bike. Now, yes. Single camera, or do you have like stereo vision? So, I, that's, that a, that's a good question, and uh, perhaps I could actually default to to Dima. Um, Dima's the CEO of Augury. They they have developed the computer vision, and it works with a with a single camera. So, uh, I, I when I first started, you know, playing around with the concept months ago, I said, you know, we're going to need two cameras just for depth, and uh, and the technology that I've seen that that has been coming out of Augury has been remarkable with what they can do with a single camera. Um, so I don't know if you want to comment on that? I mean, sure. It's, yeah, it's, like you said, it's designed for monocular uh, safety features. Uh, so single camera, um, what's in your smartphone is more than good enough, and no matter what generation of Android phone you might have. And so uh, what they're integrating with the helmet is certainly quite impressive as far as hardware is concerned. And all the features are designed to be you know, low latency and responsive with that baseline technology. All right. Well, with that, oh yes. When is it coming out? So, so we do have a time frame. It's it's pretty loose right now. Um, there are a couple of things that need to happen between now and then to, to really achieve our goals. But it's been moving in our favor. Um, I, I I can say with certainty as as long as Fuser is still an entity and we're we're moving with this, we'll be on the market in 2015. All righty. Well, I thank you all for your time, and. Uh, and I, I have to say, keep, uh, keep an open mind, keep open eyes, because there's going to be a lot of interesting wearables coming out in, in the next couple of years, and it's really going to change the way we live on a daily basis. Thanks.